Hello, my name is Alex Rainieri. I'm the Artistic Director of the Brisbane Music Festival. Welcome to the 11th of our Meet the Artists Behind the Scenes series, which we're running on YouTube alongside our third Brisbane Music Festival streamed series. Now, usually in these videos, I would be, uh, as the artistic director of the festival, I would be interviewing the featured artists of this festival. This um, video is featuring myself. I'm not going to interview myself, but what I have done is asked uh, five or six um, patrons that have come to quite a number of the BMF events over the years to provide me with some interview questions. So, based on their... Um, provocations, I'll um, hopefully be able to share a little bit about myself that might be of interest to followers of the festival. So thanks all for being here and um... Okay, the question, uh, we have heard the journey of your guest artists so far, can you tell us about your journey? Absolutely, um, I'll try and keep it brief. Um, I started playing the piano when I was four years old. I studied with a uh, teacher by the name of Janice Connell, who instilled in me a real passion and great love for music. Um, I wasn't by any means um, at the level of child prodigy that uh, many particularly piano players um, are, um, but through my teens, through my early teens, um, fueled by a few little Estedford uh, victories, I, um, I became much more interested in practice and interested in being the best I could be at playing the piano. Um, this eventually, after a couple of um, twists and turns with teachers, uh, led me to uh, Leah Horowitz, who was my teacher and amazing mentor for quite a number of years um, and she guided me through my undergraduate study at the Queensland Conservatorium of Music where I um, finished my BMAS with first class honours. Um, after finishing at the Queensland Con, I did what many, many um, Australian musicians do. I did a audition tour in Europe. Um, I was quite set on studying it, uh, in the UK um, and I was um, accepted and um, offered scholarships at the Royal Northern College, uh, Royal Northern College of Music, uh, the Royal College of Music and the Royal Academy. Uh, none of them had, were full scholarships so there was still quite a hefty tuition fee attached but um, it was a bit of a soul searching moment because it was at a juncture of my life where I could have followed the traditional path of um, you know, pursuing a, that next step towards an international uh, career by um, doing postgraduate study at a really prestigious um, university uh, away from Australia. But my other option, which I ended up going with, was um, I had done an audition for NM for the Australian National Academy of Music. Um, and it was also at a point in my life when I was getting quite a large body of um, work as a freelance piano player in Australia and I decided to, um, to take up the offer from NM and move to Melbourne um, to study and continue to foster that growing um, pool of work opportunities here at home in Australia. Um, and that has been a really um, pivotal decision that I'm extremely glad that younger Alex made because it's very much shaped what I'm able to do with my, um, I guess, pretty diverse uh, range of work that, that I um, undertake as a freelance pianist, as an um, artistic director, and a, a number of other things. Um, my time at NM um, in Melbourne was really incredible for a number of reasons, which I might address at a later question. but. Um, I, I will mention my, my teacher while I was there, Timothy Young, who was, um, again, incredibly pivotal in guiding my piano playing in a, um, not a new direction, but in a kind of refreshed way. And I think it was uh, very much a kind of great, um, uh, a, a 
great um, collaborative kind of teacher-student relationship in that um, I was at the point where I could take on absolutely everything that Tim was throwing at me and I was able to kind of uh, throw questions back and um, I really felt like my progression as a musician, as a piano player, as a person as well, um, was really very fast-tracked in the two years that I spent at Anam. Um, in terms of my journey around that, um, whilst I was at Anam, I think it was 2014, uh, it was definitely when I was 21 years old, I had a, um, a, a splendid year of um, competition successes, which I, I won't go into speaking about the kind of pros and cons about competing and competitions, because that's a separate question, it's also not that interesting or relevant. Um, but I did have a year where I, uh, I um, won the Kerry Kerry International Piano Competition in New Zealand, I won the Anam Concerto Competition, uh, which was with the TSO, um, I won the Australian National Piano Award, which um, I was 21 at the time, 21 was the lowest age you could be, I think I was the youngest ever winner of that competition, um, and a particularly exciting win that year was um, I was awarded a, uh, a Kranichsteiner um, Stipendium Prize from the Darmstadt International Summer Courses for New Music, which um, is like the the global uh, mecca of, of contemporary music, and I was absolutely honoured to have um, been awarded that um, that uh, prize and recognition, and um, that that in particular, but all of those kind of combined competition wins, um, I guess, instilled in me a great belief in myself and my ability, and it made me start treating myself. Uh, incredibly seriously as a um, as a piano player and I felt this was the juncture where I had stopped being a student and I could firmly call myself um, uh, an, an artist if that's not too uh, too goofy <laughs> to, to say um, that was the year 2014 I mean lots has happened in my life since then but in terms of journey kind of milestones um, that was my my study path um, I was the co-artistic director and the pianist in a group called Cooper's Piano for a number of years. That was hugely um, influential in guiding my ambition and my taste and my rationale as a curator. Um, I also explored a lot of really fascinating contemporary music whilst I was in that ensemble. Um, I was asked to join the uh, famous Southern Cross soloists when I it was just leaving Anam actually, I believe it was 2015, and that was a really guiding factor in uh, my relocating back to Brisbane um, to work with uh, that ensemble that um, leads a very active performance profile. Uh, and I still work for Southern Cross Soloists, uh, of course. Um, and really, I guess the other huge career defining kind of journey moment was um, starting this Brisbane Music Festival which is now in its third year, in its third iteration, um, and there are some specific questions um, about that later, so I might uh, wrap my answer to that question there, um, wrap my ramble. <laughs> um, um, another question, when did you start playing the piano and when did you realise the piano playing could be a career? I started when I was four years old, uh, I was not very good until I was a teenager. Um, there wasn't a specific moment where I decided that piano playing was going to be the thing that I would pursue as a, a young adult, um, but what helped guide me there, as stupid as this might sound, is I just wasn't very good at anything else. Um, and I think that's not often something that uh, musicians um, will admit to, um, but uh, it was always um, my, my big passion in, in life and my parents, um, mum and dad, were so amazingly supportive on a, um, on a practical level, but also an emotional level. Um, it is a very strange thing to be doing with oneself to um, exist in the world of the arts, so I'm, I'm incredibly grateful to to mum and dad uh, for helping me be where I am now. Um, another question, 
who have been some mentors, uh, role models, influences in your career? Um, definitely um, the primary uh, ones in terms of piano playing are uh, my teachers, Leah Horowitz, um, Timothy Young, my uh, supervisor for my honours project and for my, <laughs> my ongoing DMA uh, research, Stephen Emerson. Um, Genevieve Lacey was an incredibly inspirational mentor for me when I was doing a year of um, an NM fellowship in 2016. But apart from that, uh, I guess really my parents, my friends, uh, my colleagues have all been um, very influential in uh, assisting in where I am today. Uh, did you have a career-defining moment or defining moments? Um, I've been pretty lucky to do some pretty cool things. Um, things that I haven't mentioned already are playing Bartok third piano concerto with the TSO. Uh, I won't forget that ever. It was really amazing. Um, Mozart 21 with OV, uh, Schumann with uh, Wazo and QSO as well. Um, I've been lucky to have a lot of concerto opportunities which are not often um, afforded to, uh, to musicians. Um, I've toured a number of times with uh, Andy Ottenzama, um, the clarinetist um, from Berlin Phil and uh, Deutsche Grammophon artist. Um, and uh, Andy is um, a friend and colleague and it, it's um, been great to have the chance to tour with him a few times. Um, I was involved in quite a substantial way in a show called Mozart Airborne. I think that was 2017, which was a collaborative project presented by Opera Queensland and um, now the Australasian Dance Collective, um, but then Expressions Dance Company. Um, and this was a show um, that was kind of a mashup of the best of Mozart, um, arias, songs, duets, uh, some piano music as well, and all of that meets contemporary dance. So there was a, a really fascinating um, cultural meeting Point, uh, within that that project a lot of really interesting stories shared and um, seemingly disparate artistic elements that came together and um, I guess as the piano player in that show I kind of was the the spine of um, of the show that that um, I was involved in every number I was on stage for the full show and it's actually one of the only times in my life that I've been involved in a, a season of, of shows so often you put all this work into preparing something uh, you play it once and then you're on to the next projects but uh i think we had something like a sold out 13 concert season from mozart airborne um that was a really uh that was an amazing time uh with amazing people um there are a lot more career defining moments um something i haven't spoken about much uh yet is um my love of new music and commissioning new music. Uh, there was a project in my Brisbane Music Festival last year called Blood Paths, which was kind of at the centerpiece of the uh, festival. Blood Paths, um, I commissioned 25 new, uh, new works, kind of uh, miniature works from various Australian composers. And again, this was a music and dance project. Um, a shout out to my incredible collaborator, uh, Katina Olsen, who, choreographed and performed these works with me. Um, that's a very special project, which uh, we're in the process of thinking about the next steps for. So uh, keep your um, eyes peeled for that one. Moving on though. Um, oh, this is very kind. Uh, um, you are very sympathetic to other instruments slash voice when accompanying. Have you played other musical instruments or had voice lessons? Um, <laughs> First of all, thank you. Um, I played the clarinet for quite a few years. I, um, I really liked it. There was a point where I could have gone either way between clarinet and piano. Um, obviously, I'm a piano player now. Um, I did play the violin a little bit when I was little, um, but those memories have been suppressed because I don't think I was very good. <laughs> uh, another question, uh, what is your practice routine and how does this vary in preparation for a performance. 
That's uh, it's kind of a simple question. Uh, it's also kind of a complicated question. Um, I don't have a set way that I practice. Um, I have a set warm-up routine that if I have the time to do, I will spend 30 minutes doing that warm-up routine and that um, it's not designed to advance and further my my technique or my piano playing. It's really just to bring um, the physicality of playing the piano, which is an extraordinarily strange and yet very athletic thing to be doing. It, it's um, my full warm-up routine. At the end of it, I feel very kind of connected holistically in my body and it's a series of um, extremely weird and mostly very dorky exercises that are designed to, um, I guess, pr promote the awareness of flow and that no part of the body in relation to piano playing um, works independently. Even, you know, like um, moving a finger, the motion very much comes from the whole arm, the shoulder, even if it's the most minute of gestures. Um, it's very much about framing that mentally in a way that um, is uh, promotes the kind of best uh, use. Um, I could go into a whole rant about uh, tension and imagined tension, but I, I think that's a separate question and I don't think anyone's interested either. So <laughs> um, we're not here to give a piano lesson. Um, do I have any bucket list pieces of music? Yeah, um, a lot. Um, I want to play Brahms II with orchestra someday, with Brahms Second Piano Concerto. Um, the Bert Fuhrer Piano Concerto is cool. I would love to play that. Um, there's a lot of music. Uh, being a piano player, a lot of it's for piano. You know, I don't think in my lifetime I'll ever play everything that I would like to play, um, but who knows, I'm, I'm chipping away bit by bit. Um, who are my favourite composers and why? I, I don't have favourite composers, there's, you know, historically, uh, so for old music, um, music that has stood the test of time is amazing, whether I personally like it or not. Um, if I had to choose a kind of particular period of time where I really enjoy the composition, uh, Brahms, Wagner, Strauss, Mahler, um, the latter three, not a lot of piano music there, but <laughs> maybe that's uh, part of why I like it so much. Um, favourite piece currently, not the question, but I'm answering it anyway, favourite piece currently is um, Strauss's opera Salome. Uh, let's see, some more questions. Uh, do you have a preference for solo chamber music or accompanying? No, I, I don't have a preference. Um, for me, it's very much to do with the people I'm working with, the, the content, uh, the environment, the, the paycheck. There's a lot of um, boxes that can be ticked in various formations that will guide me to having a satisfying artistic experience. Um, you are classically trained but play such a, ver a variety of styles, do you have a genre preference? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I think music is music, you know, I think um, there are all just different flavours of, um, you know, we, we all get our artistic sustenance um, regardless of the, the musical meal. Oh, that was just a tragic thing to say, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, how would I answer this? Um, I'm primarily a classical pianist. I mean, I, I play music that is identifiably from the classical canon. Um, when you work on new work, um, I think it's pretty rare for a composer to say, I am writing in an exclusively classical way. Um, because if they're emulating a style of a composer from a previous generation, um, their music is derivative, yeah, for better or worse. Um, and that sense of derivation is quite fundamental in 
are almost all facets of music making actually you know that it's important that there are uh, formulas that are followed to adhere to I guess familiarity um, and to uh, trigger certain emotional reactions from people but I find you know with all of the composers that I really enjoy working with that are within the realms of let's say contemporary art music you chat to them and you know maybe they they love Wagner but maybe their playlist is like um, you know top 50 chart toppers um, yeah, I mean, I, I mostly program within the classical canon. Um, quite often with singers, this will dip a little bit into kind of jazz, traditional folk music, uh, music theatre. Um, in those kinds of recitals, I do tend to be guided by um, the, the tastes of my collaborators. So I like to program um, with a back and forth. You know, it's important to me that in my festival, my artists are only performing music that they are passionate about. If it's a work that I I love, but they don't particularly care to put the effort into playing, you know, I'm, I'm not going to program it, or I'm, I won't program it for, for that performer in that year. Um, so that that's very important for me, uh, which I think answers the question. Um, another question, where do you see your musical journey going? Um, I feel pretty lucky. I feel like I am doing all of the things I want to be doing. Um, and I don't, I, but at the same time, I feel very ambitious and energetic with my piano playing, with my uh, festival curation. So I guess the whole forward journey is really about sustainability for me. You know, it's, it's, um, it's a weird profession to be in, uh, in terms of uh, mental health, physical health, and financial well-being, uh, but like all other musicians, you know, it's, we do a very satisfying thing, and I think we're lucky to have the opportunity to do that. So, in honouring um, that luck, I try to um, do as best work as I can and as much work as I can without pushing myself to the limit. Um, but I guess to answer the question about where is my journey going, I think. It's looking for ways to be uh, uh, more active, more healthy and happy, and um, more sustainable. Um, another, this is a very good question. Would you continue with virtual concerts in the future? Yes, you know, I think this um, pandemic has forced the arts to adapt in a way that perhaps it should have already. Um, you know, we live in a digital age um, and in presenting concerts online, albeit I don't, I would like to not exclusively give concerts to absent audiences, I do believe that this is an incredibly important and, um, yeah, an important and meaningful step in the right direction, particularly for the dissemination and the reach of classical music. So whenever I broadcast a performance, which is my whole uh, third music festival stream series, is delivered right here in my personal music studio. Um, the first show that I gave this year, um, we had listeners from all around Australia, uh, people tuned in from New Zealand, uh, Paris, Amsterdam, The Hague, London. You know, you're essentially playing to the world if, uh, you know, if anybody anywhere wants to buy a ticket, they can tune in. Um, that's very exciting. Um, it makes the, the Brisbane Music Festival um, a thing that is made in Brisbane, but for the world, as opposed to a festival that previously had been kind of collecting artists and musicians from around Australia, uh, but performing to exclusively Brisbane um, audiences. So it's a little bit of a flip for the festival in that sense. So my idea, I mean, of course, we're all kind of waiting to see how the world um, develops and, and reacts to this um, predicament that, that we're currently facing um, together. But I think ideally for concerts and the way that I present concerts is I would present a live performance and then pre um, also have a delayed online viewing opportunity that, you know, perhaps that's also part of an archive that's forever 
available um, at a kind of reduced ticket price. That kind of thing I find very interesting. Um, moving on, um, another kind of complicated question to answer. What role do you feel that the BMF is already playing in the Australian arts culture? Um, I feel like this question uh, is a polite way of asking what is the point of the Brisbane Music Festival, uh, which is not a very polite question, but, um, but it's an important one for me to be able to answer. Um, and at the heart of it, really, this festival is, you know, I, I, I love music, I love curating music, I um, am absolutely passionate about guiding my passion projects and funneling them into the one platform, which is this Brisbane Music Festival. Um, so for me, it kind of started as a way to uh, start to tick off pieces off my bucket list, um, to work with incredible musicians and to have kind of a little bit more of a legitimate platform to say, hey, I want to work with you, I want to play this piece, let's put on a concert. Um, because we're... Everyone kind of says that, but I wanted to set up um, a platform where I have um, an existing kind of uh, audience base that can grow each year um, and something that's kind of recognisably branded by which I can funnel my, oh, hey, I want to do this with you ideas into the one kind of um, under the one umbrella. So for me personally, that is the role that the BMF plays, not answering the question of what um, what it plays within the arts culture at, at large, but I think um, I think to kind of bridge um, to the next part of the answer, I think um, integrity and passion are, are things that are very difficult to balance when you are trying to treat music as a business. And it's something that I really I'm very firm about that uh, however many funding applications I write or however much I need to spend hours at my computer um, you know, promoting or um, you know, writing media releases or dealing with ticketing, um, all of the non-artistic aspects of the festival, it's important to me that these happen to allow the music to happen and that this music making is the most important thing that I am unwilling to compromise on and I, I hope that that um, kind of energy is what is shared with my artists and I hope that that energy is projected to audiences. Um, so to finally answer the question, I mean there are a few aspects of it. I mean one very obvious one is that in running a festival I provide uh, employment opportunities to a number of artists. Um, they're not kind of bank-breakingly huge, uh, you know, seasons of shows. They're often um, just uh, engaging artists to come on board for one performance. And I look to, I mean, I, I try to pay people uh, fairly for their, their work and their efforts. Um, but, you know, I think um, in going with this idea of sharing energy and sharing, sharing stories through music, you know, I, I think it's, People talk about music as being a universal language and something that binds us all together, um, regardless of who we are and um, what we do with ourselves. I think that's not to be underestimated. And ideally, I would like for this festival to be a way to connect communities um, and to use music as the platform that brings people together. So it's a pretty wishy-washy answer, but... That's, in my mind, my kind of um, rationale for why I do this crazy thing uh, that is running a festival. Um, and I super love this next question, which is much easier to answer. What is your favourite breakfast food? Um, caffeine. I generally don't eat breakfast, particularly since dairy has become a problem. So, coffee. Ah... Um, uh, what would your life most likely look like if you weren't involved musically and artistically? You know, I have no idea. This is all I've ever done professionally. I've actually never earned a cent not doing something related to music. Um, so I don't know. Um, 
what I would be doing otherwise. Probably would be making a bit more money, but you know, very happy at where, <laughs> where I'm at. Um, here's a specific question. Um, how did, how did you feel studying at Anam helped you reach where you are now? I yeah, kind of answered that before. Um, what I think is important about studying music uh, at an institution is the sense of community. And you know, you, you, the people you study with are your colleagues and your friends for life. And you know, it's, it's only the most meaningful ones that stay with you through the years. But um, uh, most of my cohort of um, friends and I guess colleagues my age now were people that I studied with at the Queensland Con or at Anam. Um, and a part of that community as well, particularly at a place like Anam, it's quite prestigious, it's difficult to get into. Um, it's kind of collecting the best of the best young players from around Australia. Um, that community spirit is very um, uh, engaging in, a, in pushing you to be your best self, your best player. So um, I think my piano playing, as I said uh, a bit earlier, um, was very much fast-tracked when I was at Anam because it was a um, community that supported for, uh, healthy competitiveness. Uh, it's not really the right word, but um, you know, it became clear, um, I think, to everyone studying at Anam um, what uh, kind of strengths we all had and how we might start to utilise them to forge a meaningful career in, in music. So um, that's how Anam helped me. Um, and outside of that, um, I just have a I did a lot of networking when I was at NM, and actually some of my donors from my Brisbane Music Festival are based in Melbourne and are people that have become extremely close friends, um, and we connected through through NM. Um, what inspires you to make music? It's a big question. Uh, I think collaboration. Um, I like to make music with good people. I like to play good music. Hopefully you get to play music with good people uh, and it's good music and you get paid well for it Usually a gig will involve two of those three things and that two or three is, is kind of enough That's kind of what I expect. Uh, you've hit the jackpot if you get paid well to make great music uh, to play great music with great people um, but you know, it's what I, I hope to provide in my festival to my, my artists so what inspires me to make music? Um, the the music itself and the incredible people that I have the privilege to collaborate with. Um, are there specific composers that you have a weakness for? Um, as I mentioned earlier, kind of Brahms, Wagner, Strauss, Mahler. I love a lot of early music, but I don't play it because it sounds not good on piano. Um, and a uh, kind of later goal in life, or maybe not in the, in the not too distant future, I want to kind of get myself a harpsichord and uh, you know, so some more um, uh, historical instruments to really explore the, the sound world of earlier music um, in a more kind of, uh, in, in a way that's a bit more realistic to um, the sound world in, for which it was created. Um, so, so no, not really. I don't have any specific composers that I have a particular weakness for. Um, <laughs> uh, how do I learn so much music? Tell me your secrets. I drown learning three pieces. Um, cool. This is a that, that was that. These these are from current conservatorium students. These few questions, just for a bit of context. <laughs> Um, sure, I, I do get through a lot of content. Um, I play a lot of music uh, each week in my kind of freelance capacity, in my um, role as associate artist at the Queensland Conservatorium and at the University of Queensland. Um, I do a lot of private accompanying. Um, yeah, there's a lot, a lot of notes. Um, a lot of the notes are repeat offenders. Um, I've, I've been doing this a little while. Um, it's kind of rare for me to be learning new things at this point in my life and at this point in my career. Um, 
how do I learn so much music? Um, I think you just have to practice doing a lot. I mean, I'm, I've always been pretty, I've always pushed myself to, to cram in content and try and do a lot as much as possible, you know? All of this kind of quality over quantity thing, it's like, well, of course quality you don't compromise on, but the quantity thing is a question about how much you're willing and able to do, and I just don't think we ever know how much we're able to do unless we're willing to push those boundaries. So, as I was an undergrad student, um, I did a lot of, I played a lot of music, and not just, uh, I didn't just learn my kind of exam program per semester, I, I played a lot. Um, and I, I would sight read a lot, you know, like I would maybe grab the Mozart sonatas from the library and it would sound like rubbish, but you know, I just play through them and sight reading practice is super important and it's important to actually practice things at tempo because you learn the tricks of how to approximate when necessary, how to scan and read, um, which, you know, sometimes when you're accompanying, like uh, last year, um, in the final kind of exam season uh, at the university, I took on quite a few student recitals. I played for 53 programs over 10 days. It's a lot of notes. Um, they're all kind of familiar, but you know, I'm not, I'm not practicing what that, that would have been maybe like 20 hours of music. You know, there's no, no time to be practicing that amount of music. So you do have to learn how to, um, you know, realize when the music actually is just, okay, these are the same scales and arpeggios I have been playing my entire piano career. You know, I don't need to practice them to be able to do them. That's in my head. Um, so it's, there's a lot of mind games involved, but you just, you, you, I think you have to practice doing a lot if that's not a silly thing to say. Um, uh, from the same person. What advice do you have conservatorium students at this stage in their music careers? Um, what are some things that you wish you'd known before entering the real world? Yeah, um, I think just practice a lot. Like when, when you start working uh, and working in a full-time capacity, even as a freelancer, you have no practice time basically. Or if you have the time to practice, you probably don't have the energy to practice, even though you have the incentive to practice. Um, so, uh, I mean, I, yeah, I guess learn as much now as you can and treat yourself as a sponge um, for soaking up as much content as you can. Play for as many people as you can. Um, take on every bit of advice as if it's important and in your own time decide whether you're actually gonna take it seriously or not. Um, I think treat yourself like a rock star is an important one that I never did when I uh, felt like I was improving day by day. You know, I think without, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm no mental health professional, um, I don't claim to be, you know, we, we all have our stuff that we go through. Um, I, it's important to me to be really kind to myself, you know, I often how it feels day by day, the process of making music and the kind of taking on a big volume of um, performing work, uh, you know, it often doesn't feel great. Uh, you're often underslept and underprepared. Um, nobody needs to know that because it doesn't sound like that. Or it, it, very often for me, how things feel are not how they sound and are not how people um, engage with it. So I think work on a really damn good poker face while you're a student and um, only let on as much as is necessary, uh, given the context. Um, I mean, apart from that, actually, um, things I would have liked to have learned, learned a bit more about as a student are really simple practical things like how to write a killer grant application, which I've kind of taught myself over the process of Oh, lots of grant applications. Um, I would love to have been better at giving interviews, uh, which is kind of a weird thing to say, giving myself an interview right now, <laughs> kind of. Um, I would love to have known more about um, exercise, dieting, and how that kind of affects mental health. Love to know a bit more about 
how to do things like um, reviewing contracts, um, practical stuff. But you know, you, you, you learn as you go. Um, and I think I've been lucky to have been surrounded by really um, great support networks along the way. Um, last few questions. Um, here's a big one. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has affected many musicians in the way they have operated. It has also impacted the Brisbane Music Festival, which is why the festival is now streamed online. Correct. Uh, apart from the obvious change of how the festival is distributed, can you tell us about some of the less obvious ways in which you've had to change your work processes? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Uh, the big thing for me being stuck at home this year has been, I never realized how much energy I got from being in different workplaces. Um, I found it a little cloudy to just be kind of living in the same place where I work and there's a lot of time on your, like, your iPad reading music or phone or you know, computer um, doing your administrative stuff. Um, yeah, I think being out in the world and working with other people, um, it, working collaboratively, like I was saying before, is a big drive for me and that's uh, not unique to me. I think everyone's feeling the same, same way. And, you know, I, I, I don't like to whinge about things I've lost. I mean, I, I had really exciting um, gigs uh, in, in, um, throughout Australia later in the year that uh, have been cancelled for obvious reasons. Um, I lost uh, both a Europe and a USA tour this year, you know, and it's nice to think that they'll be postponed, but who, uh, who knows at this point, and I'm, I'm much more in the headspace of looking to adapt and to kind of re reframe um, what I do in a way that really serves the, the music and the artistic integrity in the most meaningful way. Learning to flourish at home, I think, is a, it's not a bad thing for, for all of us. Um, and it's, I feel lucky to have the opportunity to be able to do that. Um, and a kind of uh, wonky question to end, though. I'm going to answer it because I think it's fun. Um, question is, out of all the music in your repertoire, is there any that strikes you as having erotic aestheticism in any form? And, I mean, you know, music's pretty sexy. I mean, the whole premise of um, consonance and dissonance is kind of tension release, you know, there's a there's very kind of obvious parallels in the way that we live our lives and the way we feel emotions. Um, the, these are, are um, incorporated into um, good music. Um, that, that's why we, it kind of speaks to us and takes us on a journey. I mean, there are some kind of, there, there's of course a lot of music that's a lot more kind of, I guess, sexual than others. Generally, classical music isn't, uh, doesn't give off the, the trendiest or sexiest of vibes, but, um, you know, or certainly not in a, uh, as clear and explicit a way as perhaps pop or popular styles of music, um, projects, but you know, you, you play a lot of art song and you read these incredibly beautiful poems and you realize they're all about lust and romance and there's a lot of really dirty stuff in there. Um, uh, I guess particularly uh, some composers that come to mind are Wagner, a lot of, um, you know, tension moving to more tension, you know, never quite resolving the dissonance kind of takes you on this winding, uh, um, journey that kind of builds and builds and builds and builds. Um, see where we're going with that. Um, Scriabin is another composer that um, kind of works in this kind of, although in a much more kind of mystical and unique way, um, this kind of uh, are quite a lot of uh, erotic undertones in Scriabin's music, um, particularly thinking about the, the fourth um, piano sonata, which I've, I've played quite a lot and recorded. Um, the that's very I guess Tristan esque. Um, it's very like Tristan and Isolde in that it kind of uses these harmonies that twist into the next that um never quite find a um, a peaceful rest. It's kind of always um you know part of the one one big arc. Um, 
a Fisk Riavan seventh sonata is a kind of crazy piece, a white mass sonata. Um, lots of uh, crazy kind of religious undertones there, lots of imagery, um, and again, lots of kind of... Uh, I think there's actually some explicit... I, I'm fairly sure right at the end of that sonata, there's literally an instruction to play with erotic sens sensualism or something like that. I have to check. It's probably completely wrong. Somewhere in that score is a fairly explicit marking. <laughs> That's all I can think of right now without doing some more specific homework. But, um, look, yeah, I mean, it's, um, you know, part of the way that music reflects life and humanity. Um, it reflects our kind of natural animalistic urges in, in a way uh, alongside the other spectrum of you know, the whole spectrum of human emotions. So hopefully that answers your question. Uh, you know who you are, whoever asked that one. Um, and just to, to close up this incredibly long um, video, congratulations if you've made it this far. I barely drank any of this. Mm. Um, the last question is, um, how did you pick your artists for this third Brisbane Music Festival stream series? Uh, which is a great question. Um, as I uh, explained a little bit before, um, the reach of the festival um, has become global. You know, we're effectively giving concerts to the world, provided the world buys tickets. You can grab your tickets to the final five concerts at brismusicfestival.com. Um, but the artists have all been Brisbane based um, out of necessity, but you know, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't in any way um, think of that as a, as a compromise. You know, I think uh, a bit of an Australian mentality that's n not a, a great one is that um, you know, artists that travel to be here are somewhat shinier and, and better than what we have here. And you know, I think we've all got to live somewhere. You know, um, Brisbane is an incredible city filled with amazing artists and amazing people. And I'm so grateful to the huge amount of artists that have come on board um, from my series this year. And, and just, just to do a, a quick shout out to all of them as a, as a huge thank you. Um, I, I would like to um, thank so, so much my, um, my collaborators, which include... Um, uh, Marion Heckenberg, uh, Oliver Scott, uh, Katie Stenzel, um, the Southern Cross Soloists, which included the, the Brisbane based members, uh, Tanya Fraser, Jonathan Henderson, Alan Smith, um, Eva Kong, uh, Jenna Robertson, uh, Trish and Paul Dean from uh, Ensemble Q, um, Angus Wilson, percussionist. Uh, we have four BMF young artists involved this year that um, have been doing amazing work so far. Uh, Shuhe Lawson, Dario Scalabrini, uh, Jemima Drews and Laura Rainieri. Um, and thank you also to the composers that are, are writing new works for this festival. I premiered a, a new work by Kate Moore um, earlier in the series and right at the end of the series we have four new works by uh, Jodie Ruddle, Hannah Reed smith Samantha Wolf, and Jacob Bragg. So you're all amazing. Thank you so much for going on this journey with me. Um, why I collaborate, I'm coll collaborating with you. Um, you're all awesome. Uh, I ha have working relationships with uh, almost all of you. Um, and you know, it's, um, it, as I said, it's a vibrant city filled with vibrant people and I am just trying to do vibrant things um, with with you guys. So thank you all so much for your, for those of, who have um, already performed in the series. You are amazing. You're incredible. Thank you for those yet to come. I can't wait to work with you. Um, and I hope that uh, any viewers of this video uh, might be further enticed if you haven't already to jump over and check out the rest of the series. Uh, we've got five concerts left. Um, it's a show every second Saturday. And jump over to our website, which is www.brizmusicfestival.com. Thank you guys so much for listening. Um, and check out the rest of our Meet the Artist series, which are yet to come. See you later.